We have with us uh, Professor Narada Varnasurya, one of the most qualified and versatile academias from Sri Lanka. Welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Professor, what brings you to Australia? It's a purely personal visit. I'm visiting my cousin, especially uh, Professor Sena, who's my first cousin, but who's almost a brother to me. We grew up together. Uh, he's not well these days. I thought I'll make a visit. And in the same time, I have four other first cousins in <laughs> Melbourne. I'm visiting all of them. Yeah. Sri Lanka probably will be <laughs> missing you with all the stuff and everything that you get involved with, Professor. Uh, well, I think they can easily. No one is, uh, uh, you know, absolutely essential to find anything. Yeah, but going, going back in your history and your past, yeah. Professor, how did you get involved and how do you find the time, the amount of time that you have done in your career? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, the first thing was, uh, although I am in the medical profession, medicine was not my first choice, really. In a way, my mother had a strong... Uh, hand in pushing me into medicine. So even when I came into medicine, I was very much more interested in sociology and humanities, etc. To a certain extent, that has uh, influenced the way my career has evolved. You see, actually, you know, and first, actually, I want to do public health, but again, due to certain specific circumstances at that time when I was young and training, I couldn't do public health and I did pediatrics, right? But uh, within pediatrics, I have found a way to get involved more in the community and the social aspects of pediatrics. And with that, as a medical teacher, I also got involved in education and medical education first and then now even in general education and things. So that's why I have in a way, uh, although I'm a medical professional and a professor in pediatrics, I have migrated to other areas uh, which are more general. And if you take your, your career and you look back at it, what would you say was the most constructive thing that has come out from your research, your studies and your educational background? Yeah, I think my research is not all that outstanding, but uh, certainly in involvement, I have been very much involved in getting research, not my own but everybody else research into practice. That's a very important thing because there are some really bright scientists uh, who do a lot of research. Uh, unfortunately, that stays in, the, in their files or in their PhD thesis. It never gets into action. But it, it, uh, you know, you, somebody has to put, bring that out. So especially at a senior level, I have been able to be in a lot of policy making bodies, whether it be in health or nutrition or in education. And in all of these, especially being a, a university teacher, I have taught in several universities, uh, I have been able to identify the work of young people who can actually contribute to practice or change to policy. So in that sense, uh, I have done much. It, it's not my own research, actually. A little bit of it may be my own, but mostly the so others' been, research. Been, been able to facilitate Facilitate, that yes, yes. Yeah, I even say the week before I came, I was involved as a panel member of the National Science and Technology Awards. That's the highest set of awards you can give for scientists. They're awarded in 12 areas, like, you know, getting uh, science and technology for sustainable development, using indigenous knowledge in sustainable development. And so all the top level scientists in Sri Lanka have applied for those. And, and we really uh, spent <laughs> a very long time going into it in a very formal and organized way, trying to identify people who can be held up as an example to others. How so is this directly translated to the medical field in Sri Lanka? So in the medical field in Sri Lanka actually is quite well developed. You know what I mean? You know, for a country of our GDP, we are performing far better than at comparable level. You know, like our health indicators, like infant mortality rate, the maternal mortality rate, the life expectancy at birth, they are all well above our level. P if we speak from purely economic terms, from the Jeep, we are about 20 places above in our human development index. That is essentially due to uh, what I would say is the free health services and the free education we have had since independence. So, uh, you know, thanks to people like, you know, uh, Dr. C. W. W. Khanangara. I'm not uh, trying to be political here, but we have to face a fact. Now all of us are living in the reality of the market economy. 
the liberal economy. And maybe that kind of total welfareism is not sustainable anymore. But we have to be truly, we have to acknowledge that it was that which gave us this solid foundation. For example, long before any other country in Asia or in most parts of the world, in the 1940s, our government set up what are called health units, that is the medical officer of health units, you know, consisting of a medical officer of health, a public health midwife, public health inspector, and, and public health nurse. Now, actually these indicators that we have achieved are not necessarily due to pediatricians or gynecologists or specialists. We also have contributed in a small way, but I think the, the greater credit for that tech, <laughs> that achievement goes to the field services, you know, at the primary care level. Yeah. Yeah. You were just talking about the midwife, the yeah. role the midwife yeah. plays in Sri Lanka in the suburbs and the rural yes. areas. Yes. Could you just elaborate on that for me? Yeah. The, if, Sri Lanka, every person in Sri Lanka is, uh, there is a midwife assigned to a designated population of about 3,000 or 4,000, right? And she is supposed to provide firstly what's called a domiciliary service. That is, she is supposed to go and enroll all pregnant mothers and preschool children. And she has a register. And then she invites them to clinics. Uh, and, and then from there, and then even the care, you know, now for example, a pregnant mother, the care they get is called shared care. They are registered in a local clinic, a primary clinic, and it's linked to the local hospital, the secondary. So the hospital and the community provi co provide care together. If you look at the, um, the, uh, uh, the medical colleges and the medical schools in Sri Lanka now, mm -hmm. would you say that it, it, it can sustain the output of doctors that we require? Uh, this is a very contentious issue, whether we have achieved the correct number of doctors or we have to produce far more. I am on the, uh, or in the group which says that we are approaching saturation point fairly soon. Actually, uh, a colleague of ours, he's a, he's a maxillofacial uh, surgeon actually, who is also an accountant and a banker. He's the director of human resource management at the ministry. Now, he has done a very, very, very complete study, which is available on the web, actually, his details, which clearly shows that if we continue to produce, we have nine medical schools now with an output of 4,200, and then we have a large number of students, you know, in foreign medical schools who come back and sit the ERPM and join our pool. So, if we continue at this age, by about 2022, we'll be achieving a ratio of nearly 1 to 500, which is f more than enough. Because even this number, 1 to 500 or 1 to 1000, is not a fixed number. It depends on what other services are complementary to that of the doctor. Now, if in a country where all the services, including primary health services, are provided by the doctor himself, then you need a larger number of doctors. But in a country like ours, where you get excellent primary health services provided by other professions, not, not, not necessarily doctors, then the number of doctors you need is less because we need the doctors at for higher level functions. And the infant mortality rate. Ah, yeah, that, that, that is what I referred to, the Human Development Index, the infant mortality rate. We are the lowest in South Asia, far below all the other uh, close by countries. Maternal mortality is the same and even the life expectancy and our literacy rate, you know, and one of the things that facilitates why we have a low, you know, these are all interconnected. Why do we have a low infant mortality rate? One reason is because our mothers are highly literate. When mothers are literate, then the children are looked after better, right? It's not the skill necessarily of the higher level professionals. It's the general awareness in the population, etc., that drives up your quality of life and so the free education yeah, is free inter education interlinked with everything. Yes, of course. Yeah. And if you had a suggestion for Sri Lankan in the medical environment, what would your suggestion be for the next five to ten years? Uh, in in the in the medical, medical education in field or in the medical education? Both education and the in the medical education, I think we should do we should develop the existing medical schools, right? Uh, we have about nine or ten now. Another two are being added. I think if they are well developed and more facilities are given and more clinical training facilities are given, we can easily absorb all who need to have medical education into those medical schools. But there is a pressing argument to have uh, private medical schools, I must say. So I would like to 
be an, uh, what they are what they're saying is, especially because of the current uh, system of selection to universities, which is uh, you know based on district quotas, only 40 percent is on merit. Some very bright students who are in the in the better districts fail to get a chance to enter medicine, although they have scored good scores. I think that's a valid point. I think the correction for that is to in fact do away or reduce the district quota, not to create private medical schools, you know. But there is another answer saying, you know, why can't we export doctors, you know, like we export housemaids and all. So I'm not going far down that argument. Other thing is they say uh, in a sustained liberty, you know, giving examples like Malaysia, that we can attract foreign students and make it a money making venture education that is to you know by having good private medical schools. I think taking all this into account I would say I would not be against having one or two private medical schools in Sri Lanka if they are properly conceived and properly run. Right. Unfortunately we haven't had that for various reasons. So that is what I would say. I certainly would not be for a large number of one, you know, unrestricted private medical education in Sri Lanka. I think state medical education should be developed further. It should be given access to more number of teaching hospitals and we can certainly absorb a greater number of students and, uh, and meet the needs of Sri Lanka quite easily. And of a medical system, you, you would believe you know, with the statistics that you've given me, it's quite a high standard. Yeah, it, it is quite high standard. I mean, any, it is any, not by any the improvement that you would require. No, any uh, any improvement that is, uh, I think I'm a member of the Medical Council and I have been sitting on a disciplinary committee also for the last six years. And there are now more and more people are aware of that and they are complaining against malpractices by doctors. And I, I've seen them at this thing. But when we look at the picture, large majority of those malpractices are not regarding the competency of the doctor or his technical performance. Actually, there has been very few where that has been the factor. Most have been in their personal relations oh, okay. and their ability to communicate or their need to communicate or the desire to communicate. So that has come out very strongly. Uh, after 20 years, the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine reflected on their performance. Uh, their students are all, well, there are quite a large number of them come for placements in Australia because we insist on a, on, on a training in a center of excellence abroad before you can be certified as a uh, consultant in Sri Lanka. So they go all over England, Australia, New Zealand, States, mm -hmm. India even, or, or Singapore sometimes. So when they took stock, what they found was this, that there was a lack in the communication and ethical aspects and problems like conflict of interest, how to resolve. So we decided to introduce a stream into the Postgraduate Institute. All the specialists now, there is a compulsory stream on uh, professional development and ethics, which they have to complete before they are board certified. I'm glad to say that I play a role in that. In fact, my particular one is I do a half day workshop on conflict of interest in professionals. You know, that it's a very important topic, right? You know, and, and uh, it's a practical session. We do case scenarios, etc. And they go through that. So all our doctors are going through. In fact, <laughs> I attended a uh, WHO uh, workshop on conflict of interest and they were uh, very pleased to hear that we have such a thing which is compulsory for all uh, doctors in Sri Lanka. You know? Thank you, <laughs> Professor, for giving us a great insight into the medical field in Sri Lanka and your personal life. And yes. We are privileged to have you here and we look forward to contributing to the medical field in Sri Lanka in the future. Thank you. Thank you.